All right, welcome. This is a workshop uh, with Mo Wickham, who I'm going to uh, introduce in a moment, a workshop called uh, The Trauma of Incarceration. Uh, welcome, my name is Amy Shuster, and I use uh, pronouns they, them, theirs. I'm a member of the organizing team um, and the moderator for this session. Um, I want to make you aware that the closed captioning is still available. So if you go, go down and click on that live transcript button and click show, uh, show subtitles, uh, you'll be able to, uh, to follow along also with some, um, some live language there. And, um, and we are uh, you know, very sorry that you cannot rename yourself um, at this point. So um, when you do log in, maybe before the next session, if you want to include your pronouns, if they're not already there, by all means, we encourage you to do so. Um, we uh, have a lot of uh, people and, and organizations who, who we are standing on the shoulders of in running this conference. And in particular, we looked at uh, the way that Project Mia thinks about community agreements and um, and we, probably Mo can tell us all about Project Nia, um, but uh, so, some of the things that I wanna say to you right now are really inspired by um, some of the words that we've actually uh, learned from, from Project Nia. And in particular, we wanna remind us all or just be mindful of the way in which you know, we have a broad conception of abolition um, in our conference, but we, we do think there's a baseline that it's important to um, remember, uh, which is that abolitionist futures are not compatible with white supremacy, settler colonialism, uh, misogyny, uh, heterosexism, transphobia, ableism, classism, misogynoir, um, all the kind of intersectional things that we could also be saying here. So, uh, but we're also aware that uh, we are also agents of that oppression, um, that these systems of oppression um, operate um, around us and, um, and we are doing what we can um, in order to remove them, to lessen their impact. And so we really are relying upon all of us in this, in this space to, to try to hold out the possibility for a more just future, a, more, a future that embraces abolition. So if you can help me um, as well and have the courage along with me to, um, Notice those exercises of power that that need to be um, that need to be called out for enacting harm and and help us all uh, embrace this as a learning moment as a moment in which we can really move forward. I would appreciate that, and I hope other people. Um, I, I I trust other people in the room would appreciate that, as well. So um, if one of our organizers um, does happen to remove you from this session, I really just want to um, emphasize that um, our goal there is not. To, uh, to signal a kind of punishment um, or to exclude you, uh, but it's our way of trying to express the care um, that we have in holding, in holding this space together. So um, I'm super excited to introduce uh, Mo Wickham, uh, who uses they them theirs pronouns. Mo attended the um, New York State University at Albany and received a Bachelor's of Arts in Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies and Sociology in 2011. Um, they've engaged in graduate work in women's gender, sexuality studies and mental health coaching, uh, excuse me, mental, mental health counseling. Um, currently Mo is a sexual assault counselor working with incarcerated victims, survivors of sexual violence. Prior to working as a counselor, Mo worked with incarcerated parents and their children um, and has assisted people um, incarcerated in New York State prisons with legal issues related to their confinement. Mo is the communication chair for the Justice Studies Association and is an executive board member of the New York Civil Liberties Union Capital Region uh, chapter. And they're also an artist and writer working to shed light on social injustices and address their own trauma and healing. So at that point, I would love to turn it over to Mo and encourage you all to use a hashtag imagining abolition 2021. Thank you so much. I am honored to be here and really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it all works okay. Can folks see this okay? Yeah, we are seeing your um, your slides right now. Awesome, okay, thank you. Um, so as Amy had said, my name is Mo Whitcomb. I use they, them, theirs pronouns, and I'm an artist, writer, and healer. Um, and I'm going to um, talk about the trauma of incarceration. And I do have some questions that I'm gonna pose um, to you all. And please feel free to unmute yourself or um, you know, raise your hand or, or share in the chat if you wanna to respond to those questions. 
So I'd first like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, for those who don't know what a land acknowledgement is, um, it acknowledges the people who were stewards of the land before the devastation of colonialism. And it recognizes that colonial colonialism is a current and ongoing process. And it also helps us to understand the longstanding history that has brought us to reside on this land. It allows for a deeper awareness of our place in the history and processes of, of colonialism. It also honors the indigenous people and the historical and intergenerational trauma of colonial violence. Um, I've included a link um, and on this slide called nativeland.ca um, and you can go to that um, website and um, put in where you live and you can um, find out who the original stewards of the land that you are living on are. Um, so if you'd like to do that during the presentation, please feel free to share that in the chat if you want to share, um, you know, the people who came before us. Um, I live on the occupied land of the Haudenosaunee and Mohican people, also known as Albany, New York. I do want to um, just provide some trigger and content warnings. Um, I will be talking about um, sexual violence, institutional violence, incarceration in prisons, um, particularly sexual violence in prisons, and also um, racism, sexism, and cisgenderism, as well as other forms of oppression. Um, and just so you all know, throughout the workshop, I will have a couple of um, what I like to call breath breaks. Um, so we can take a moment to reground ourselves if we need to. Um, but I also just wanna encourage folks, um, you know, with the content of like what I'll be sharing to take care of yourself. Um, and if you need to step away at any time, I really encourage you to do so because, you know, we're all, we're all priorities. Um, I think it's really important to um, acknowledge the different identities that I embody, especially as someone who's kind of here imparting knowledge and facilitating a workshop, um, and also in my work um, kind of engaging with uh, folks who are incarcerated. Um, so I think it's important for me to note the privileges that I do hold, of which I have many. Uh, in this context, I think the most important privilege for me to acknowledge is that I'm white and I have never been incarcerated. Um, while I do hold much privilege, I also embody identities that society oppresses and invalidates. I do not identify with my sex assigned at birth. I identify as genderqueer, uh, non-binary, and as pansexual. Um, and then just acknowledging too that this is complicated by the fact that um, I do have some passing, passing privilege, which does allow me to move through the world and navigate systems with more ease than other people. Um, and that for me, an identity acknowledgement in this context is really important um, because the trauma of incarceration impacts Black, Indigenous, people of color the most deeply. Um, and that recognizing that this is a direct result of um, systemic racism and white supremacy. Um, and just, you know, I think it's important to note that as a white person, I will never attempt to convey or understand the experiences of Black, Indigenous, people of color. And I'll only come from a place of my own experience um, and knowledge and understanding that, that comes with limitations. I do come from a family impacted by incarceration. I carry the experience of having a mom, dad, and brother who were incarcerated during my lifetime. When I was 10 years old, my dad was convicted of a violent crime and was, was sent to state prison for eight to 10 years. He got out of prison when I was 18. My mom has used alcohol and other substances to cope with her own trauma during her life. When I was a senior in high school, she violated probation um, and was sent to Wayne County Jail for six months. She was released in the spring of my senior year of high school in time to see, my, uh, to see me graduate. My brother, who is four years older than me, was in and out of county jail during most of my middle and high school years. When I was a sophomore in college, my brother was arrested and sent to state prison for two years. The incarceration of each of my family members impacted me in different ways. My dad's incarceration was particularly challenging because of the types of crime he committed. It didn't take long for most of my family, um, most of my friends and their families to find out what had happened. I experienced a lot of isolation, stigma, shame, and guilt. My mom's incarceration was especially painful because while she was in jail, my grandmother passed away. And as I mentioned earlier, it was also my senior year of high school, which was a difficult time to not have my mom with me. My brother's incarceration was not as hard on me because of, for most of my life, I didn't live with my brother. And I had also seen him in jail a lot while I was growing up. Um, but it was really hard on my mom. And what, was, what impacted me most um, was watching her grieve and worry every day while he was incarcerated. 
I shared my story about having um, family members incarcerated because I really want to sh shed light on the experience of having a loved one incarcerated. I think that um, stories of the families of incarcerated folks are often left out of the narrative, especially when Mo, we lost your um, audio there. I'm so sorry to interrupt. The last it's, thing, yeah, I think I just heard you again. The last thing we heard was that when you leave out stories um, of the family, um, when there are people who are incarcerated. Sorry, um, did, I, did I cut out my audio cut out again? Yep. Okay, um, so um, thank you. Um, so I was just saying that um, I think it's important to um, center the stories of the families who have loved ones incarcerated because it's often left out of kind of the mainstream narrative when we talk about mass incarceration. Um, and I also share my story as someone who witnessed my family struggling to adjust to society after they were released. And just to note that some of what I share throughout my workshop is from my own personal experience. I also just want to make a note about using people first language. Um, I, and this might not be like new to um, folks here, but um, I don't use words like offender or inmate or prisoner. Um, language is so powerful and it really can kind of, you know, put a lot of stigma on people. Um, so I will use um, person or people who are incarcerated. Um, I also don't use words like abuser or perpetrator when talking about folks who um, do harm. I will say person who did harm. Um, I don't use, you know, gendered um, language either because violence has no gender and we don't want to rely on just statistics on like who experiences um, violence the most because it's very pervasive. Um, I also use folks, folks with an X as a way to um, address a crowd in like a more gender inclusive way. And I will, I usually tend to use both survivors and victims to acknowledge that those two words can mean very different things for different people. And then some of my foundational frameworks and concepts, um, I just wanna share so that um, um, you all kind of know where I'm coming from with some of the things that I'll be talking about. So I come from the framework that incarceration is trauma. Um, it often um, compounds on triggers and or exacerbates past trauma as well. I also come from a place um, where I um, you know, believe that oppression is also an experience of trauma um, and that it's often felt through generations and throughout history. Um, and I also come from the um, kind of framework that um, post-traumatic stress disorder is a Western concept. Um, and this really comes from the idea that um, the post and post-traumatic stress disorder implies that the trauma ends. Um, and in prison, um, you know, until someone re is released, trauma is repetitive and ongoing and risks to safety, safety are not imagine imaginary, they are continuous and, and real. Like there's real risks of safety. It's not it's not a, you know, I, I think that I believe there's a risk, but there isn't, you know, there's, there's usually a continual risk there. Um, I also believe that trauma is passed through DNA. Um, trauma causes epigenetic changes to DNA and therefore trauma is passed from generation to generation. Um, and finally, um, and I think really important for the context of this conference is that, um, you know, abolishing systems of harm is really integral to trauma and healing work. Um, and that's something, you know, that I talk a lot with my incarcerated clients about who are dealing with their own individual and personal trauma and healing um, and talking about also how systems harm and we really have to um, move past those systems and create new systems to be able to truly um, do healing work. Um, I also come from a healing center and engagement perspective. Um, there's kind of in the sexual um, anti-violence, like anti-sexual violence world, trauma-informed care has been sort of a buzzword. Um, and it tends to focus on the harm um, and presumes the trauma is in, in, an, in an individual experience rather than a collective experience. Um, whereas healing-centered engagement um, is more holistic and it focuses on culture, spirituality, activism, and collective healing. Um, the trauma-informed care approach also requires healers to treat trauma in people, but it provides little insight or guidance to address and acknowledge the root causes of trauma in families, communities, and institutions. Um, but a healing-centered engagement approach really originates from the idea that harm does not happen in a vacuum, 
and that we must um, transform the root causes of harm within institutions. I'd really like to kind of go over this a little bit, especially in the context of incarceration, because um, a healing centered engagement um, approach is explicitly political rather than clinical. So it really looks at how our systems, how political systems influence how people heal. Um, and it also has an approach um, that really looks at healing as a restoration of identity. And, you know, as I think um, folks might know, you know, um, incarceration as an experience really strips people of their identity. And so I think when we're talking about healing for people who have experienced incarceration, we really have to talk about that restoration of identity. So I'm going to have, if folks want to take a quick breath break, um, I will take three breaths with you all if you'd like to do that, or you can just kind of sit back for a minute um, just to take a breather before we kind of get into some, some more of the, the trauma um, information and some of the questions I'm going to pose. So we can take, take three deep breaths together. Thank you. So I just want to pose the first question, which is, um, in what ways do folks think that people who are incarcerated experience trauma? Um, and please feel free to um, raise your hand to be unmuted or to um, put anything in the chat. So I'm happy to have people just unmute themselves if they do want to speak directly. And I can also read things from the chat if people okay, think offer it that way as well. Do you mind if we just take a moment and think about it as well? Yeah, of course. Yeah, take folks can definitely take their time and totally understand if it's later in the day. So if people are not, you know, feeling um, very and, you know, want to kind of answer, it's all good. I think one way I want to offer is um, separation from family and other loved ones. I have Benish Ahmed, I apologize if I've said your name wrong, Benish Ahmed has written Confinement, Freedoms Are Stolen, yep. A has written um, Isolation, Financial, Physical, Emotional, The Whole Self is Harmed. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think we've just empowered people to be able to unmute themselves. So okay. <laughs> if that was, if we were trying and that wasn't successful. Um, I think we just figured out the technology. Yes, it is working. Did you want to offer something? Yeah, I, I guess for me, I would say that um, the the physical trauma, so the the violence that happens between people who are caged up of, you know, they're acting out their violence on each other, uh, physically, sexually, um, emotionally, you know, through the words. And um, th that the, I would imagine that the corrections officers or the officers, the wardens, um, because of the socialization of dehumanization and the majority of the population, um, I'm assuming are going to be people of color or who, or who identify, you know, as, as uh, black indigenous or people of color that then again, then that violence will be enacted by the prejudice and, and their behaviors. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that's absolutely true. And what I've seen in my work is that, that, you know, the culture of corrections and, you know, the biases um, that people hold um, in the privileges that they hold very much um, kind of play out in, in violence in prisons. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to, um, and thank you all for sharing that, you know, it's definitely physical trauma, but there's so much, you know, emotional and mental trauma also that goes along with being in prison, including like the isolation that folks were talking about and that separation from family can be really challenging. Mm 
Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Does anyone else have anything they want to share before I move on? I just want to give everyone a chance. Mo, there's been a wellspring in the chat, and I we're happy to save the chat and to and to include it with the recording. But I didn't know if you wanted me to read out, or if other people who've posted in the chat would like to to speak out what they have already written. Um, if you wanna if you wanna read some of the things out, that would be great, just to kind of see where people what people are thinking. Um, <clears throat> Diana Restrepo or Strepo um, writes, the trauma is experienced by not being able to help others who are outside. Mm -hmm. Saran Cisse, self-doubt, regret, and discomfort with themselves. And then um, Diana Restro, um, sorry, I'm getting it wrong again. Um, Restropo, um, also with the aggressions inside. Mm -hmm. And then um, Nathan Renshaw has um, has shared a poem from Jimmy uh, from Jimmy um, Santiago Baca's memoir, "A Place to Stand." Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. Um, I really appreciate it, um, and thank you for sharing that poem. Um, I'll have to look into that. That's great. Um, thank you so much. So, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it moving because I know we have to stay on track here. So um, I just want to kind of go through, you know, some of the um, places where, you know, we, we do see um, trauma um, and it starts before people are incarcerated. Um, so this is a little stats heavy, but um, I just want to give folks kind of an idea of, of, of where people are coming from when they, when they come into the prison system or, or the jail. Mo, I think we lost your audio again. The last thing we heard was um, this is what people experience when they come into the prison system. 7% of incarcerated individuals born female have experienced intimate partner violence, and 60% of incarcerated individuals born female reported caregiver violence. Um, and it's also um, important to acknowledge, too, that um, there's also a lot of neglect that folks have experienced as children, um, as well as um, abandonment. So those things, you know, people are coming into a violent system, a traumatic system, with already a lot of trauma um, that they embody and that they're, and that they're working through. The other thing I think is important to talk about, um, especially when we're talking about kind of the trauma before incarceration, is the concept of institutional betrayal. Um, and that refers to wrongdoings done by an institution upon individuals dependent on the institution. Um, so this can include failure to protect or keep safe um, and failure to prevent or respond to individuals who are harmed by people who are kind of, you know, within the context of the institution or who are actors of the institution. Um, so I don't know if folks are familiar with this, with this term institutional betrayal, but um, again, kind of opening it up to the audience, I was wondering if folks wanted to share how they might see institutional betrayal um, experienced in a prison, jail, or detention center. Um, you know, what, what kinds of dynamics in prisons might cause someone to feel sort of betrayed by the institution? So I just want to I can give folks a couple, a couple moments to think on that. We have one auth, um, offering from Athena Garcia who writes, um, this is a new term for me. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, this is um, something that uh, is also uh, fairly new to me, but in doing research about kind of institutional trauma, this has come up quite a few times. Um, and I think it's really important um, because of kind of sometimes the trajectory of people coming into prison, they've really, you know, interacted with a lot of institutions. Any other thoughts? Priscilla Bustamante writes, no accountability or survivors being punished for reporting misconduct, sexual or otherwise, by corrections officers. Believing a victim or survivor when they disclose about their experience. 
Um, oftentimes, um, unfortunately, at least in my experience with New York State prisons, um, victims and survivors might get punished as a result of their experience with sexual violence. So, for example, if they were, you know, if an incarcerated person was being assaulted or there's an attempt of assault by a staff member and an incarcerated person fought back, the incarcerated person often faces disciplinary consequences um, for that, um, including use of solitary confinement, unfortunately. Um, and this can also be experienced by just the fact that a sexual assault happened, right? So like the failure of correction staff to protect um, or keep incarcerated folks from being harmed in the first place. There's also like a ton of institutional processes that really um, don't always work for incarcerated folks and they often cause more harm. Um, there's a lot in New York state prisons, you know, folks have to kind of use this grievance process to um, uh, like, you know, kind of communicate if they're facing issues and oftentimes those grievances are denied and that really invalidates the experience of, of a person who's been harmed, who's incarcerated and that often feels like a betrayal. Um, in the context of sexual assault in New York state prisons, um, the kind of investigation process is is really kind of disgusting in terms of like how those investigations um, conclude. Um, so I do have some stats here that in 2017, which is the most recent data we have for New York State prisons, there were 273 um, investigations for of, of sexual violence. Um, 164 or 42.8% were found unsubstantiated, um, which means that they investigated it and found that there was no merit. 91 of the 273 or 23.8% were determined to be unfounded. That means that like they're just basically telling the incarcerated survivor or victim that it didn't happen. Um, and only 17 or 4.4% were substantiated, which means that they were validated. It was found that those that happened and you know, then there's some kind of like consequences for that for the person who did harm. Um, and as a person doing this work, um, I can tell you that those numbers are ridiculous. You know, there's, um, there's so many cases um, of people getting harmed um, and harassed um, and you know they're they're valid um, and the fact that these cases kind of end up um, unfounded or uns unsubstantiated um, creates a tremendous um, experience of betrayal and I think it's also important to um, you know sort of look at the idea that institutional betrayal is not a one-time experience often people who are incarcerated have had a lifetime of experience with institutional betrayal largely because you know um, of systems of oppression and systematic oppression um, folks can experience institutional betrayal from the education system um, foster care or what is um, in new york state called child protective services um, this can happen in juvenile detention and also can happen in healthcare systems or mental health care systems um, and we find in healthcare systems that's especially true for, tra for transgender folks who are incarcerated um, and i really you know Institutional betrayal is really important in talking about trauma because it often compounds and then manifests as, tra as trauma um, and it causes people to not trust systems and unfortunately potentially to not seek services because, you know, folks kind of are experiencing this betrayal over and over again, it can make it really, really hard for them to trust when people are, are providing services to them. And then, like I said earlier, um, too, um, I believe that incarceration is trauma and there's a lot of sort of um, ways that this can come out. Um, you know, one of those things is harsh phys physical and environmental conditions, you know, um, cells and dorms are very uncomfortable places to live. Um, there's not a lot of comfort, you know, in, in prisons. Um, there's limited outside time. Um, you know, I live in upstate New York where we have like pretty severe winters. so winter can be a very hard time for folks who are in prison because they can't get that outside time outside of the facility. Um, there's also um, sometimes overhead lights are on for 24 hours a day. This is especially true in solitary confinement in New York State. Um, and, you know, um, the use of overhead, like of overhead lights for um, 24 hours a day is has been used as a form of torture by governments, including the US military. So you know, that, that's like when people are in solitary confinement, that is an experience of torture on top of like, you know, not being able to sleep because these lights are on for 24 hours a day. 
folks often um, also experience extreme temperatures um, in New York State prisons in the winter it's incredibly cold and in the summers it's incredibly hot um, and I've been I've done a lot of work inside prisons and it's extremely uncomfortable. Um, there's also, like I mentioned before too, a loss of identity. Folks are often referred to by their um, identification number or just their last name. And there's also, um, for transgender folks in New York State, um, they are incarcerated in the um, in facilities that match their 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 sex, so not their gender identity. Um, and so folks um, in those situations often are referred to by their their legal name or their dead name, and that can um, also be a, a huge loss of identity for people who kind of have built up a, a gender identity over their lives. There's also a lack of bodily autonomy in terms of, you know, being able to have privacy and things, which, you know, down at the bottom, it says lack of privacy, but that's one of the big things is being able to have privacy, being able to um, move about in ways that feel comfortable, um, that is really lacking in prisons. There's also a use of surveillance that can be really pervasive for folks. Um, and the use of restraints too is a really big one um, because this often happens when there isn't a safety risk. Um, when I uh, talk to people on the phone who are in solitary confinement in New York State, they are in um, ankle sh shackles and they're also in wrist shackles that are attached to a, a stomach like restraint. Um, these people are in an enclosed room with the corrections officers on the outside of the door it's not appropriate for them to be in, in those restraints when they're talking to me on the phone. And that can be really traumatizing for people, especially if they have, have past trauma that involved like being restrained or being held down. Um, people also have to undergo pat frisks and strip searches. Um, every time someone comes to talk to me on a phone, when they leave the phone area, they get strip searched. So I often have to prepare my clients for that. Um, because, you know, um, people that can be really triggering if people have experienced sexual violence. Um, and often people too will report to me that, that there was an inappropriate pat frisk and that, um, that people were groped or, you know, touched inappropriately during a pat frisk. And then also, you know, the experiences of oppression in prison, um, especially racism, heterosexism and cisgenderism um are incredibly traumatic and people can't get away from it you know they're they're very much kind of trapped in that situation um so that can be incredibly traumatic as an experience of incarceration people there's also vicarious trauma in prison um, for folks who aren't familiar with this um term it refers to trauma that is experienced from witnessing harm and or violence um, and as we know, you know, prisons are very violent, there's a lot of harm, and there's a lot of oppression. And people who are incarcerated can't really control what they see and hear, um, you know, depending on kind of where they're at. So um, this can be really hard for people, especially if they have past trauma, because witnessing violence can really trigger that and bring it back. Um, and that can be incredibly challenging for people. Um, you know, I've had people who are doing really well, they're on their healing journey and then you know they see someone get harmed and that's kind of like suddenly like no i think we lost your audio there i don't know if you can hear us it has really come out of actually um, in talking about the pandemic and how people who are isolated are suffering because of the lack of um, touch or physical contact. Um, so touch starvation um, occurs when a person experiences little to no physical con contact for a prolonged period of time. It can lead to or increase stress, anxiety, depression. It can cause low satisfaction, difficulty sleeping and for fatigue. Um, and Alternatives that are often used for comfort for touch starvation, such as taking long baths or showers, wrapping up in blankets, or cuddling a pet or a cushion are just not available to incarcerated people. So, um, you know, the kind of alternatives that, that we might have kind of in the community if we're experiencing this are, are not available to, to folks who are incarcerated. Um, and in New York State prisons, um, incarcerated people are typically not allowed to touch one another, even platonically, it's, it's very much um, discouraged. 
Um, Pre-pandemic, incarcerated individuals were usually able to give their loved ones hugs, like a hello hug and a goodbye hug. Um, but new visitation policies um, due to the pandemic have actually restricted any touch during visits due to the pandemic. So this becomes really difficult, especially when parents can't hug their children. I, I work with a lot of folks who are our parents, and um, this has been a really hard time for them because they can't they can't like have that bonding with their children. Um, and, you know, I really talk about touch starvation because it truly is part of the trauma that's experienced during incarceration. Um, and it's something that can impact people over a very long period of time. So I know I've, I've given lots of information. So I just have um, our last kind of breath break for um, our time. So again, I'm going to take three deep breaths please feel free to do it with me or just take a moment to kind of, um, you know, think on, on what we've been talking about and, and ground yourself. Okay, thank you. So as a sexual assault counselor, I spend a lot of time talking with clients about trauma responses, especially the foundational fight, flight, or freeze. Um, I think a lot of us can sort of recall a time when our brain's stress responses kicked in, like, you know, if you hear a scary sound in the dark and you suddenly, like, can't move, so you're experiencing that freeze um, sort of response, or you can't help but feel like you need to run, um, and that can be the, the flight response. And those are natural brain responses to stress. The problem is that when people experience stress, which can be trauma over and over again, over long periods of time, their brains sometimes can be on overdrive, even when there is no actual risk of danger. This is the foundation of the Western concept of PTSD is that people's brains um, are perceiving risk that isn't there, right? But in prison, the risk is there. Um, and, and speaking with incarcerated clients about trauma responses, it's always limited. Um, and during one session with a client who did give me permission to share the quote, um, they said there's no flight in prison. Um, and there really isn't. You know, if you are, are experiencing an assault or violence, you can't run away from it. That, that will get you in trouble. That could get you harmed more. And I argue that there isn't really fight or freeze either. Um, if an incarcerated person is assaulted by correction staff in particular, um, fighting back even in self-defense is likely to increase physical injury and increase the chances of a person being harmed, um, having a disciplinary consequence. So, and again, in New York State Prison, this can include solitary confinement. It can include being locked in your cell, which is called keep lock. And it can also include loss of privileges, including visitation and phone calls with family. If a person freezes as a trauma response um, and they're being told some, like that they need to do something, even if what they're being told is wrong or violent, um, they may risk being assaulted or getting further injured or possibly getting a disciplinary consequence for disobeying a direct order. Um, so I just, it's, it's really weird because I work with incarcerated uh, survivors, victims, and also work with community um, survivor and victims. Um, and it's really so different. It's really unsafe for an incarcerated person to have a trauma reaction um, because, and sometimes those are reactions to the traumas they're experiencing because they're incarcerated. Um, and this is something I think that people doing mental health or trauma work with incarcerated people have to really deeply consider because often clients will be triggered by the healing process. You know, there's this kind of idea that when you're healing, it's often an opening of wounds before you can close them. And that can be a really, that can be a really hard place to be in when you're in prison and you're in this controlled environment. Um, and so oftentimes when I have done sessions with clients where we've discussed really deeper painful experiences, I have to check in with them before we end our session and remind them of their coping skills or any safety planning we've done. Um, and I always like, you know, give them like sort of the hotline information if they need to call someone in crisis, if they're in crisis. Um, because I truly worry that when people go back to, you know, back from the call that we had that, and they're in a bad place that their healing process could be penalized. They could like really get punished for this experience in their own healing. And they can also get punished for just experiencing what our brains do when we're in stressful situations. So there's just so much limitations to how people can kind of process their trauma and react to their trauma. I also think it's important that we 
look at how um, experiences of trauma and when people are incarcerated impacts their daily life post release. Um, you know, often people are more easily star startled. Um, some people who have been incarcerated have reported experiences of being startled by the sound of keys jingling or doors or gates closing or loud noises. Um, there's also could be a dislike of fear or of crowds or, or enclosed spaces, even if that kind of wasn't a fear before. Um, kind of having a little personal space or being in enclosed spaces can trigger memories of being in prison and it can cause upset, anxiety or panic or depression, lots of different kinds of consequences for that. Um, folks might feel overwhelmed by the lack of routine and structure and kind of that they have more free time. Um, and whenever I talk to my clients about that, they really don't believe me that this is like a thing. Cause they're like, of course I want the free time. Um, and then I've done follow up with people who have said that truly like it's really overwhelming. Um, and this often, you know, can be different, um, especially if someone's been in prison for a long time. This is often um, that overwhelmed feeling. Um, and I often have to kind of work with people to, you know, make sure they have a appointment book and a notebook to keep track of things um, and to really kind of fill some of their time because it can be really overwhelming. Um, there's also um, a fear or discomfort sometimes in public spaces. Folks sometimes keep their back against walls um, so that they can kind of see everything and there's nothing behind them. Um, this is something that my brother still, still does and he's been out of prison for about seven or eight years. Um, and folks often also give themselves plenty of visual range, again, so they can kind of see everything that's going on. And one of the most common one things that I've seen is that folks experience an overwhelming fear or anxiety about going back to prison, even if there isn't a true risk, like even if they're doing everything that they, you know, know they have to do if they're on parole or probation. Um, people are very scared about going back to prison and often experience flashback at, flashbacks and nightmares of their experience. Um, and this, you know, this can be really hard for folks to kind of, you know, need to get done what they get, need to get done because they really do have this true fear. Um, and oftentimes, you know, I think that's because of, of that institutional betrayal, because folks who are incarcerated know that systems don't work. Um, and so I think, and that they're unjust um, and oppressive. And so I think that um, folks are really kind of internalize that and, and have some true fear about going back. And it's also important to, to kind of note the impacts on reconnection with family and community. Um, you know, the stigma that folks experience can be really, really challenging to work through and can impact relationships. Um, that hypervigilance of, you know, kind of feeling like you're in danger or, you know, have a risk of, of violence once you're out of prison. That can be really hard for families, especially to kind of understand, especially if they haven't experienced incarceration themselves or it's a new experience for their family. Um, folks often experience fear, paranoia, and worsen their new mental health. And that obviously also impacts kind of relationships and how people can move through the world once they're released. Um, there's also kind of those collateral consequences too, like job discrimination, um, felony disenfranchisement in terms of voting rights and, and rights to do like jury duty, um, housing discrimination, um, some of the ridiculous restrictions that people have when they're on parole, um, and then educational restrictions too, like people with felonies are barred from federal funding for college education. So those things are all, you know, things that really impact people's ability to be a part of, of community and society again. Um, and then also, you know, going back to the, the touch starvation concept, um, that can have real impacts on relationships and bonding with children. Um, and those can be very challenging when folks are coming back to their family and back to um, their communities. And then there's also, um, you know, I think as a direct service provider and, you know, I, if there's folks, you know, here who are who are part of this workshop who do work with incarcerated folks, I think it's really important to kind of look at how how trauma does impact the dynamics that people that incarcerated people or formerly incarcerated people have with service providers. Um, you know, I think in terms of institutional betrayal, that kind of concept or experience is not taken seriously by service providers. I've seen that before, um, or it's blamed on the individual rather than the institutions. You know, people, you know, shouldn't get in trouble if if they don't want to, you know, experience trauma or experience kind of that betrayal, which is you know kind of a backwards concept. But that is something that sometimes service providers have that assumption or have that bias. 
And the other thing is, you know, people who are providing services, what their assumptions of people who are incarcerated are, what their biases are, you know, people thinking that, you know, I have people who work with me who refuse to provide their last name because they're afraid that their clients, when they get released, are going to come look them up and stuff like that. And those kinds of things, you know, really impact the rapport and trust that you can kind of have with clients who are incarcerated. Um, incarcerated clients often boundary push, and this is unfortunately often a punished kind of behavior. Um, but really, if we're looking at trauma, often boundary pushing is an ex is a reaction to isolation. Folks want to know about you. They want to connect with you as like a service provider. And so they sometimes will push those kind of professional boundaries. Um, and a lot of times the reaction to that is, okay, you, you know, you're being inappropriate. We can no longer work with you. Um, but I think you really have to kind of look at that in the context of trauma. And I think you also have to look at agitation and lashing out from clients as in the context of trauma as well. Um, because often people lash out and are agitated because they are in a trauma response. Um, but oftentimes, again, that's one of those kind of punished behaviors or behavior that sort of um, eliminates a person's ability to seek services, more services. Um, and I've also seen the experiences of oppression not validated, you know, folks who don't believe that that's an, an impact um, that can be incredibly invalidating and can be triggering for folks as well. Um, and so I think really kind of the, the important thing to remember is that if we are working in direct service with incarcerated folks or formerly incarcerated folks, we have to address these sort of impacts within the context of trauma and oppression. And really my final kind of takeaway is that, you know, um, abolitionist frameworks and practices must address trauma from a healing centered approach. I think in order to truly practice abolition, we must address trauma sort of in that healing centered approach um, and that kind of coming from the perspective that only when people have the opportunity to heal from the emotional, mental and physical trauma of an institutions can they truly be free. Um, and so I guess the last question um, that I wanna to pose to the audience is what could this look like? What could it look like um, to include healing from trauma in our abolition work? Um, you know, what are some examples of that and how can we integrate that? Um, so if folks have any ideas about, you know, what that could look like, I would love um, for folks to share in the chat or to um, unmute and, and talk about it. Just going to give people a moment to write. So the question is, what would an abolitionist future look like um, that actually addressed incarceration as a trauma? Thank you for the rephrase. A writes in the chat, mental health advocates and providers um, being at a hearing um, and part of the legal process, that would be at least a modest improvement. Yeah, Carlin, that's a great point. Sorry, Carlin, go ahead. Word empowerment a couple of years ago, but so I'm thinking, uh, I mean, you got to look at the historical and material conditions sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, in a, in a, a really hardcore prison is much different than a minimum custody prison and the way people react. Uh, I noticed that it's sort of like uh, William James kind of idea that in a prison that's really real criminals, I guess you could say. I mean, guys that aren't the ones that we're all talking about, the ones that, you know, why'd that guy go to prison? Or they're not really, the guys that were really like the the head of the gangs and 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 ones that you might think, well, what are we gonna do with this kind of people? Uh, they seem to realize, uh, I'll use the word trauma, but that everybody has their own trauma. And that sort of builds a community in the prison because everybody where everybody is sort of different but everybody's everybody has something happening to them 
but it drives them together. And if, even though there's, there's strange outbreaks of violence, they mostly have to do with drug territory, sometimes with sex or gambling, but it gets resolved and then the community goes on. Mm -hmm. It's not much different than the street in some sense. I mean, if we're gonna talk about a word trauma and, and assign stuff to it, I mean, aren't we all traumatized from capitalism? I mean, if you wanna make a general approach and then everything, things fall out of that. So, I mean, all the stuff that everybody put up on the board and that two of you were talking about is really good. I mean, you hit on almost every point. It's hard to I me. Mean, there's probably points you could delve into, but you'd have to, I think you'd have to address like different historical conditions too, because I remember in Sing Sing in the sixties and then when you let, they let you out in the morning, you had to walk through the snow to, you know how they walk on the yard. I don't know if you've ever been in prison or, but you've seen prison movies, right? How people walk on the yard. When you come out of Sing Sing <laughs> early in the morning, the snow's up to your knees, right? And the first guy's out got to make the path in the snow. And everybody's, you know, got their own little personal problems, traumatized problems, because all that stuff you said is true. And I noticed that as you go down in levels, in California, you got levels, right? As you go down in levels, when you get to the lower level prisons, there is no more of a criminal class or a prison race. It's, it's mostly people that are had a bad day and then they're in there and they're definitely they're traumatized because they're not, they, what's the prison system have to do with them? I mean, they know they did something wrong. They were traumatized from the minute they did the one wrong thing in their life. And then you have the, in California, as an example, Reagan shut down all the mental institutions. Where are you going to put those people, the ones that, that are, the ones that they haven't picked up from the homeless uh, areas, right, are in the prisons. And so that has nothing to do with crime or all this stuff. All this stuff is set up in the prisons. Uh, think about the people who work in the prisons. I mean, Alan, thank you so much. I mean, you're calling us attention to not just the trauma in incarceration, but also the trauma that causes um, incarceration. So thank you so much. I just want to also hold space for other people as well. So if you could just um, give us maybe some of your final thoughts. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, there are a few other uh, things in the chat. Would you like me to read them? Sure, if you don't mind. Mia writes, uh, stop asking about criminal history for jobs mm -hmm. to reduce psychological oppression of people who are re-entering. Agreed, 100%. <laughs> Athena Garcia uh, writes, it would provide counseling services prior to people who are about to, to leave prison. That's our five minute mark. Um, A writes, let people rent apartments, especially if their record has no um, physically violent crimes. Mm -hmm. um, some kind of housing law change is needed. Yes, thank you. Those are all amazing suggestions. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of different areas, you know, um, that we can come from too, like, you know, folks are mentioning housing, fo folks are mentioning mental health services, that like closing down of mental institutions, that's really real. That's like the big mass incarceration, part of the mass incarceration boom um, that happened historically. So I think there's so many different areas where this can, we can address trauma as part of kind of, you know, our work towards abolishing harmful institutions and sort of, you know, imagining what the future can look like. Um, so thank you so much for folks who um, shared. I really appreciate your ideas because I think, you know, we all kind of have to work um, together to find kind of the best ways that we can truly address prom trauma as part of as part of abolition work. I wanted to add something. Um, I think what we're all kind of getting at in terms of um, housing, you know, changes to housing law, et cetera, changes to education, um, gets at the idea, and this is something that I'm continuing to kind of, or just really starting to experiment with in my own um, research, 
and my own work, which I hope will have a community um, aspect to it at some point sooner rather than later, um, is the idea of non-reformist reforms. Mm -hmm. So things that do fundamentally change the system although they might not abolish it in and, in and of itself, but they fundamentally change the system in a positive way, not in a way that simply recreates the system or allows the system to recreate or regenerate itself, but reforms that lead are steps on the road to abolition. And I'm drawing that, um, I'm not sure of the genealogy of it, but I'm personally drawing that from a talk um, by Dr. Layat Ben Moshe. Thank you for sharing that. Are there any final thoughts here? A writes, uh, more types of halfway houses. Uh, mm -hmm. Temporary housing, voluntary institutions, affordable in caps, free in caps housing, rehabs that are actually nice and meet the needs, especially the healthcare issues and wants of people to prevent prison and to bridge return post time. Thank you so much. That was beautifully written. Um, I, I, you know, I, I agree too that there needs to be, you know, I mean, so many of the um, issues that bring people to prison are social issues. So if we're look, if we actually look at those issues, right, um, it can really spare a lot of people from the trauma of incarceration kind of in the first place. Um, so I see these things as both sort of preventative and then also, you know, so sort of reactive to after the fact, um, you know, in this current system that we have. Um, but the hope is that those things can kind of be part of what we do and so that the trauma truly doesn't have to be experienced in the first place. So I know we only have one minute left so I just wanted to leave you with my contact information. Um, I'm on Instagram at momakesart. Um, you can email me at momakesart at gmail.com and I also have a WordPress um, where I do some writing and share my artwork um, and that is there. Um, I know we don't have a ton of time for um, lingering questions, but I also want to share um, information about how to support um, the son and um, mother of Dante Wright's son who was um, killed in Minnesota, murdered by police in Minnesota. So I just wanted to leave folks with that as well, because I'd be remiss not to mention sort of some of the um, things that are already are right now impacting our, our community and our world. So I'll leave you with that. Um, I know it's it's we're about time. So if folks have any questions um, kind of lingering after the fact, please feel free to contact me. Um, and thank you so much for being here with me and, and for engaging in the conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mo, so much. I wanted to just say, it sounds like the idea about institutional betrayal was um, something that really struck people. And then there was one other comment in the chat I wanted to make sure was, was voiced out. Um, A wrote, People leaving long solitary confinement or long sentences sometimes can't bear touch anymore. Um, even kind touches causes them pain, um, sometimes for life. And a call to abolish prison, a call to um, end solitary confinement. So those are two ideas I think that really uh, struck people deeply. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Thank you everyone. <laughs>